everyone. Happy New Year. Hey, sweet mates out there on LinkedIn Live, Facebook, and YouTube, and directly on the Her Sweet Spot platform. Welcome to the first live event for 2022. We actually had a first our first Friday mixer, but this is the first event broadcast live, restreaming all over the place. I'm your founder and host of Her Sweet Spot and Her Sweet Spot Salon Talk. I'm excited for today's guest. We'll be speaking with Dr. Christine Lee. She is a clinical psychologist in private practice right here in New York City and is also known for her work as the procrastination coach. Her procrastination coach blog is the number one blog in the world on the topic of procrastination. She has helped thousands overcome the procrastination habit and get crystal clear on what needs to be done so they can get into action fast and achieve their goals. And hello, it's the start of a new year. This is what the main topics are on every talk show, on every platform. We're talking about goal setting. Dr. Lee's new book, Five minute self discipline exercise. Stay motivated, cultivate good habits, and achieve your goals is a compilation of her best strategies set inside an engaging workbook format. You can listen to Dr. Lee's brand new podcast, Make Time for Success, which is the topic for today for inspiration, for creating a life of joy, productivity and abundance. Hello, Dr. Lee. Hi, Marsha. Hello, everyone. Thanks for listening today. Thank Happy New Year. <laughs> Happy New Year. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Comment in the chat. Get ready for your questions because we're going to take a deep dive into Dr. Lee's career as a psychologist and just get into a little bit of truly how do we make time for success? Dr. Lee is the Her Sweet Spot mentor for the month. You can get more information directly on our website, on our homepage, www.hersweetspot.com to learn more about her and get access to her um, digital footprint out there. So Dr. Lee, thank you for joining me today and being the first. <laughs> thank you so much, Marsha. I'm excited to be here. I want to also thank Natasha Nurse for thinking of me for your group and your community. Natasha Nurse, my right, left side, arm, hand and everything. I love her. Thank you. Natasha, hope you're watching. Uh, so let's get into learning more about you, Dr. Lee. Can you share a little bit more with us about your career and the early part of your career and really what led you to want to get into the people business? Because I think psych psychologists, are they're, they're like, pe it's the people industry. It is the people industry. And that's why it's kind of funny that I'm in the people <laughs> industry. I think I've always been uh, an extrovert at heart, but I grew up really shy and basically non-speaking, almost mute, and just a daughter of immigrants and did what I was supposed to do, was academically pretty sound, but socially, emotionally, psychologically, was really feeling directionless and was lacking in a lot of different skill areas, including communication. So that's why I say it's kind of funny that I ended up in a people area. And I went to college and after college, I didn't quite have a specific direction that I knew I wanted to take. And there was jo a job at the admissions office where I went to school and I applied and landed the job and then ended up traveling the West Coast, Hawaii, Arizona, and being very fortunate to have that experience as someone who really wasn't a great talker or comfortable talker uh, to meet lots of people, interview lots of people, comfort their parents, speak to alumni of the university and be on my own. So yeah. really there was no one that I could rely on or co-present with. This was me on the road back in the day when we didn't have uh, GPS and things right. like that. So it was a real lesson in autonomy, communication, organization, all of those things. And 
from that experience, I realized I was interested in people's stories mm -hmm. and I did enjoy the process of doing that work. So I thought, let me figure out what kind of field would fit this. And I took some courses in counseling and psychology because I was not that kind of a major in undergraduate. So what did, you major in? What, what did I, you major in? I was majoring in all the other things, <laughs> English, literature, East Asian studies, women's studies. So those are great eye-opening areas to- And that, in, that involves the, the study of learning people's behaviors and habits too. Fine. Absolutely. Learning the fine. women's yeah. studies behavior courses yeah. were amazing and, and included- courses on women's voices and mm -hmm. expanding women's voices and the cultural social components of having women's voices be suppressed. Mm -hmm. So I was always interested in those kinds of things. I think I was an early natural feminist back in the, in high school when there were no female politicians. Now there, we have some to point towards, but back in the day, I was wondering why are there no people to report on? <laughs> I can't do a report if there are no women. <laughs> representation, we keep right. saying representation matters everywhere. Correct. So that was a horrifying discovery back in high school. And I was just always interested in, I think, issues of gender equity, mm -hmm. very naturally. I think I was raised in a gender equal household. So that was a good thing. Yeah. And then I wandered into master's level courses in psychology, found them to be quite in alignment with how I thought and felt and, and perceived the world. Then I did some more work, did a whole master's degree in developmental psychology to be qualified to apply to the doctoral program and then the rest is history. But I should say that all of this was quite an accident because I did not know that everyone was in therapy. I did not know that there was this whole universe of analysis and social work and psychiatry and mental illness. I was really, that just wasn't the, the background I came from. Uh -huh. And I think back then also people were not as upfront about, oh, who's your therapist? Or, you right. know, are you going even to therapy today? Now. Yeah. It's, even it's, still it's, now we're, we're, we're learning how to get comfortable with needing therapy and, and seeking it. I think it's much more openly promoted as, yeah. as a concept. So it is easier. And I should say there were no Asian, uh, supervisors for me or professors. And so that was another experience of yeah. being in a diverse group, but having very few Asian colleagues. No representation. Peers. Yeah. Yes. And how did that make you feel? I, I, so with all of that, all of those barriers, all of uh, um, the, the, the challenges you felt in communicating did you have a mentor or a sponsor that kind of pushed you in the field as you got closer, perhaps, and went further in your studies, a professor <laughs> or someone that helped you really see it further? I have had so many over the years. I think way back when I was really in this, where do I go? How do I build a career out of this? I did have a professor, her name was is Dr. Barbara Wallace at Teachers College, who I think kind of took me under her wing and I didn't really realize that that was what was happening. Yeah. So it was just a nice introduction into what kind of work you could do as a clinician. Mm -hmm. And she also advised me not to go into school psychology, which was where I was headed, and to go into clinical psychology because she believed that you, and she was right, that you could do all, you could do school psychology as a clinical psychologist. So that this would give me more. A broader reach. And, and in, in, in the industry and more, more ability to do what I might want to do in the future. And that was, I think, really saying, you can do this. You should try for this. You should accept this yeah. and you should walk in this path. And so, yes, she was very much uh, an early mentor for me. How, how important do you think that that 
having that type because I think now we we're talking more about sponsorship and mentorship in your field and within your industry and so many women I've spoke to so many executives so many leaders such as yourself have all said I had it but I didn't know that's what it was and I would imagine that the person that was sponsoring didn't know that's what they were doing but they knew something propelled them to influence the next generation of leaders, right? Yes. I think she knew what she was doing. I did. I don't think I knew what I was doing at the time. <laughs> she is still influencing future clinicians and leaders and from what I've been reading. And also, um, yeah, I think mentorship is a huge part of a career development belief in yourself, knowing what options are available to you, taking the shorter route, which can mm-hmm. be really helpful, Yeah, not stressing yourself out. And it's not that there aren't complications, but it's great to know you have a mentor who has been there, who is very comfortable with that level of performance mm-hmm. in your, in your sphere. Yeah. And I think it's very comforting and it was great. I, I have always looked up to teachers from a very young age and feel like it's a marvelous profession to take on. It's a marvelous one and one that we took for granted before COVID and COVID has helped us realize how valuable teachers are. Certainly I, yes. I have a great appreciation for teachers. In in your time um, as a clinician and through the years, have you gone down the route where maybe you have done the student studies and what what was your maybe your biggest lessons that you learned thus far what do you mean by student studies have you have you gone have you just remained in the clinical uh work that you do now or have you been working in different areas so for the past 10 years i've been doing the online work and that includes doing all the setting of marketing and promotion and attraction and course creation, all this fun stuff that's out there. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I've done that with the focus of communicating my message that procrastination is something that you can recover from Mm -hmm. and that it's something that you should spend your time and attention on to recover from if it happens to be something you're struggling with. So I have branched out in conjunction with my private practice and work with individual clients, I've started to work with groups online and I have a membership and a podcast and all of that. And that has been very enriching. Actually, it has fed my practice and the way I work with individual clients, because I feel like I've learned so many different techniques and ways of thinking from hiring mentors, hiring coaches to teach me about the online space And about human psychology in a different way, just from a marketplace standpoint rather than a mental health standpoint. I think what you're doing and what you just mentioned is so important for every leader and every woman out here working a job, whether it is your private practice, there is still opportunity to have a side hustle from your main hustle. So the side hustle gig and gig economy is not truly just about that you work within corporations for someone else, but even within private practice, you sought out um, developing yourself through your your passions for maybe wanting to learn more about this di- digital space that we're in, which is so fascinating. I would say that I didn't see it at the time as a personal development activity. I saw mm-hmm. this as a mission. It still mm-hmm. is a mission for me. But that was the driving force because in my industry, you're not supposed to have a website or back in the day, again, yeah. you were not supposed to have a website. You, I was taught not to advertise my services. I did not have anyone in my field to look at at the time as that I knew as someone who had a space online for a themselves. Brand, a brand. A brand. Uh, no yeah. one. Zero people that I knew. And I thought culturally and professionally that I was doing something that was a little naughty and I did it anyway, because, you know, I have a history of some naughty uh, naughtiness when it comes to speaking up, speaking out, things like that too. Mm -hmm. And 
all the development, personal development stuff, just uncovered the talkative, extroverted, yeah. loud yeah. person that was underneath all the shyness and and cluelessness that were the early years. So I've had a lot of fun. I want to encourage anybody who's listening, if you're on the fence about doing something, to go explore. You can always scale it back, but you can also find your life's purpose and your dharma, your mission, the thing that is going to get you some more income or some more fun or some more colleagues that joy, really, right? Yeah, yeah, joy and people who really fit with you, people that you can really trust and work with and grow with. So it's really a lot of fun. Risk is, <laughs> we need to to come up with another word to, to capture healthy risk, healthy mm -hmm. and life promoting risk yeah. that this is the kind of risk you want to run towards rather you than to shy leap. away from. Right. Leap, leap first. Uh, your podcast is called make time for success. And as it I is. said, and we've said in, in, in your, your byline, you are known as the procrastination coach. So when people come to you to work with you, um, you have this two, two sides of your, um, your, your offerings and your service. When they come to you as the psychologist, do they realize how much the therapy or the, the, the fears and success go hand in hand with procrastination and some of the things you, um, I'm sure you may uncover with people that the procrastination is just masking itself as fear. And for the most part, for many of us is fear of success, right? I think I have a huge fear of success, especially when it's just about to get like good. It's like, oh my God, it's, I, I feel more pressure. So let me just go have a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> no, I need the coffee because I, because, because I feel stressed. So I'm going to just not do anything. And it's, it's procrastination and fear. How, that's how that's people... why coffee is so popular, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. How do people, what are some of the ahas and breakthroughs that you get out of being both the procrastination coach and the psychologist? I think the, the, the benefits are so many that every day, every hour, every insight that is shared or shared back with me is growth potential. It's release of anxiety potential. It is removal of roadblock potential. And I feel like I'm in the removal of roadblock business that I mm -hmm. offer people a way to consider and master the things that they feel are in their way. And so often, as you know, with your coffee example, it's the feeling that is scaring us. It's not actually something that is coming towards us, threatening us in any real right. bodily way or even emotional way sometimes is that we can generate all the fear that's needed. Yeah. <laughs> so we don't even have to do stressful work. And I think my training as a clinician really does help me to design techniques to help the procrastinator because my role is to really keep myself calm as the clinician so that the patient can be in their full selves in the room with me so that they don't have to be worrying about me while they're talking about themselves. I'm not going to be dangerous. I'm not going to be judgmental. I'm not going to be X, Y, or Z. So it's an open space for exploration and growth. And I feel that that's what we need to do as individuals when we're trying to excel or progress in any area of our lives. If you want to be a better cook, you have to get comfortable with like messes and messing up and burning things and people not liking your dishes and all of these, the extra cost, yeah. all of these things. But if you're not willing to be bigger and be daring, then you're going to stay smaller. And right. that is all right, especially in times like these when small is has to be good enough sometimes. But if you feel like you're craving more, I would love to help you feel the inspiration that you could take that healthy risk. You could drink the coffee and go back mm -hmm. and feel energized to do one or two more steps forward. There is nothing stopping you except fear. Right. Everything else is a problem that can be worked through. And the fear is actually what you're 
you're clinging to when you feel like you're in a stuck position? I think for, for me too, it, 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 it's kind of handed down fear too, right? Our parents, um, out of protection, and I and I talk about this when it comes to entrepreneurship and why family members are often the first person to say, no, don't do that. It's too risky or don't take, don't go for that high level job. It's too stressful, too risky. And it's out of protection that they're trying to protect you from the, the, the hard times to come, right? In, in the pursuit for um greater success. So with that, what does success mean? What what should people feel making time for success for themselves look like? Because I think um, the digital the digital world and social media has made us feel like there is a certain highness of success that we are to achieve. That's a great insight. I do agree with you that there's all sorts of aspirational things now that people can see. I think there's a good side and a bad side to all of that, to everything. And for me, success really isn't an ascension Uh idea, although I may sound like that sometimes. I see it more as an alignment issue that your thoughts, your feelings, and your behaviors are coordinated. Yeah. That you're what you intend to see in the world is what you produce, yeah. When you have an intention to produce something, and that could be a 10 year process, that could be a five year process that might never result in any outcome. So, you might fail in your efforts, but the success in saying, I have this thought, I have this feeling, I'm going to pursue it, and that you get yourself into that zone as often as you can, as best Uh as you can. So there's an aspirational element to it, but that is for fun. I I don't do, do no no longer ascribe to the suffering model of productivity. You do Uh not have to suffer. You do not have to be the tough guy or girl to get what you want in life. And so that's my definition of success. It's, it's a little wonky, but it works for me that we can't, we can't include suffering in anything that Joy and suffering, I don't think they they belong together. So no, yeah. no, you you should not have to suffer to achieve joy. Yes. And I think that's a very important thing that people need to be reminded of because there's just so many people that say you have to burn through it. You have to burn through it, and then you have the 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 other side. Well, if it's okay to be mediocre sometimes, which people do not try to give much more credit to, you know, inside her sweet spot, our members are working women who are running their small business, having a full-time job in in whether it's their own proprietary business full-time and and their side hustle. You have been doing this for 10 years, dual, dual positions. Other than that, what passions do you have and how do you spend your downtime? I like learning, as you could probably tell. I I spend a lot of effort just with these coaches and with these groups around the coaches. And it's been so much fun for me. I listen to podcasts. I dance for exercise. I have a very well-behaved dog. <laughs> I, he has been great. She's been really a great companion during these pandemic times. I like to do crafts, but I can't say that I've spent much time doing crafty things. I like to spend time with friends. I like to watch basketball and I like to spend time with friends and family. I I'm a big luncher. I, I like to have a meal and a discussion with people. That's where I feel just like life, it slows down and, yeah. you know, you feel your connection yeah. with people. Yeah. And that my apologies about the noise. Though. No, that's quite okay. So what is the one quote or affirmation if you should do that? I, I could imagine that you do do some type of affirming mm-hmm. exercises. Um, what is that one <coughs> phrase that you use to get you feeling good and ready to take down procrastination. This is, I have to say, it's my favorite quote. It is from Edison. 
and now I'm doubting myself, but it's Edison, I believe. If we all did the things we are really capable of doing, we would literally astound ourselves. And when I saw that on a mug at a home goods store, or it was a journal, I think, I thought that's that's it. That really is how I feel. That's how I perceive the universe and yeah. human experience that we're thinking very small oftentimes, but when we think of really what is possible for each one of us in any given day, we would fall on the floor. We would yeah. just be so overwhelmed. And in some ways that is an expression of anxiety. Our daily anxiety is really like, oh my God, but what if I could be a success? Right. What if this coffee could lead me to be the CEO or to the next breakthrough or the next launch? Right. It's all possible. And so we try every day to not go around being completely astounded and overwhelmed. We try to function. But my goal is to help people function and be astounding in their work and their personal lives that there's so much room for growth and for excellence. And we just have to decide what we want. We have to set the vision and we have to set the commitment to move forward in a way that will get us there like Edison did. Yes. Excellent. Thank you so much. Dr. Lee for spending a little time with me, letting us get to know you a little better and just sharing your words of wisdom on how exactly to make time for success. If you guys are looking to connect with Dr. Lee, where can they find you? Thank you so much, Marsha, for your kindness here and your lovely conversation, the coffee talk. <laughs> I appreciated your honesty about your struggles with success too, because I share the same the same kinds of issues, although I'm not a coffee drinker. Uh, I would love for your community to be connected with my community. We're all together in this, and I am reachable at procrastinationcoach.com, the website, and I would love for everyone to take a listen to the Make Time for Success podcast. Marsha will be on in an episode in the near future. I have lots of great people on the show. Natasha Nurse gave one of my favorite episodes of all time. It's just... She's fun. She's fun to talk to, right? She's like rocket fuel as a person, in a person. And so really take take a listen to the Make Time for Success podcast and then follow me on social media if you would like at Procrastination Coach too. Thank you so much, Marcia. Thank you. It is my pleasure, you guys. It is another amazing conversation with another executive leader in her field. I'm so thrilled that I was able to have a chat with Dr. Lee today. So guys, if you are looking for more support be sure to reach out to Dr. Lee if you feel procrastination is one of those things that you um, are struggling with today. And you know how I like to end each show. When we empower each other, we all rise. Be sure to head to hersweetspot.com to go get a direct link to Dr. Lee and to learn about ways you can register and become a member of the Her Sweet Spot community. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>